In June 1918, Emily Smith's son was killed in action on the Western Front. Eight weeks later, and three months before the guns fell silent, signalling the end of the Great War, Emily attempted to hang herself from the staircase in her Sydney home. She used the Union Jack as a noose. Emily was committed to the Callan Park Mental Asylum where she would sit vacantly for hours, clawing at the skin on her face and methodically tearing out her hair, telling the doctors she was in her grave. The diagnosis as to the cause of Emily's insanity was emphatic. The file reads, worry over son killed in war. The medical staff reported that Emily would wander around the wards aimlessly, looking for any little thing belonging to her boy. Emily died in the asylum eight months later during the Spanish flu pandemic. She was 66. Emily's story is a small snapshot of the depth of bereavement across Australia during and after the First World War. These four photographs show the raw grief of parents expressed through war grave epitaphs for 18-year-old Harry, only a boy, but died as a man for liberty and freedom, his mum and dad. It shows the reality of the asylum as an instrument of both treatment and control and the often callous use of language from doctors as they sought to describe these war-damaged men and women. Stupid, confused, very demented. My thesis is a social history of the extremities of bereavement and mental illness among Australian parents who lost their sons during the First World War. It uses the closed psychiatric medical files from three major Sydney asylums to explore the innate, permanent and devastating psychological reactions to grief, such as we see with Emily. But why is this important? Every one of us here this evening in this room is a son or a daughter, a brother or a sister, a mother or a father, a partner or a friend. Love and loss is the essence of our humanity and in exploring the impact of death and bereavement on Australians as a result of war allows us to locate a hidden history of Australians. The second thing my research does is give a voice to those people who have traditionally been marginalised and silenced in the historical record. For Emily was as much a casualty of war as her son. Thank you. I guess my question is, um, thank you very much, and, and I guess we're all moved by, by, by your, your presentation, but what relationship or why is it more important to study bereavement during war than the, the, the sort of similar bereavement of other parents to their children? Yes. Um, I contextualise my thesis with a broader overview of parental bereavement across much of history. Uh, my beginning premise is that parental bereavement has a certain exquisiteness that other types of bereavement don't. Um, it's not to prioritise one being harder or worse, it's just different. Um, I reduced that to looking at wartime bereavement in an Australian context of the First World War. Of the 60,000 Australians killed in the First World War, 25,000 have no known grave. There was nothing to come back to families, there was no information, there was no evidence. There was nothing. These families had their sons die on the other side of the world, 12,000 miles away, mostly in unknown graves that they would know they would never visit. It made that bereavement process so much harder because it contrasted so nastily with what was expected, that you knew how the person died, that you had access to the body, you could attend the funeral, you could grieve amongst family and friends who knew what had happened. These parents did not have that. And that's why I'm focusing on that, I guess. Oh, I've got a question. Oh, one question. Um, okay, at, at that time, the 60,000 was a relatively large percentage of the Australian population, and not only that, at the time of the breadwinning or potential breadwinning population. So, 
for the scope of your thesis, are you concentrating on the immediate effects on the family or on society as a whole of that? I'm able to, I think, draw a little bit from both. Um, first, of those 324,000 Australians embarked overseas for service in the First World War, over 80% of them were unmarried. In some rural communities, it was up to 95% were unmarried. So those young soldiers were, as you say, the breadwinner for ageing parents, and they were also um, grieved, I think, more by those ageing parents because it was expected that they would come home and have a family and be able to then provide for the, the parents in their um, old age, I guess. Um, by looking at the impact on individual families, you can then see the ripple effect on communities, on rural areas, on regional areas, on cities, on government policy as the repatriation department sought to respond in an inadequate way. But um, you can t take that ripple effect from the individual family right up to federal government policy. Thank you. Thank you.